to serve the mighty Samotas. I will rip your arms out and hang it on the wall like a... Oh. Recruits. Greetings, brothers and sisters of the banished. I am Samotas. And yes, I am an AI construct created by humans, but molded to serve the will of Atriox. In my capacity, I am programmed to train whelps like you, to train you in the origins, tactics, and goals of the banished to ensure the dream of Atriox lives on. For today's lesson, we will discuss the ranking structure of the Banished, from the lowliest grunts to the mightiest warlords of the Chiohanai. I will not, however, cover the ranks of the Order of Harmony. I'll leave it to the humans to cover the ranks of their own pitiful clan. Once I am finished here, this lesson will spark your ambition to rise above your foes and the will to crush them and take your place in the glorious army that is the Banished. Now, let us we will start at the bottom of the Panish's military hierarchy, the Ungoi. Although seemingly countless in number, the Ungoi still represents all that they have ever been, the lowliest rate of combat. Pitiful, really. Nevertheless, the Banished has granted these weaklings a modicum of honor to their roles, rewarding those who have proven their worth with higher station and greater responsibilities. It is little surprise that the squat, diminutive Ungoy still inhabit the same role they had within the Covenant military, effectively serving only as cannon fodder for the banished. Of all the species in our employ, the Ungoy are the weakest and the least inclined towards thoughtful strategy or courage. In spite of this fact, however, and given the relentless philosophy of the survival of the strong, the Ungoy have thrived within our ranks. Set free from the yoke of the Covenant, and now compensated well for their conscription, the Ungoy are no longer simply slave labor. And while many are indifferent to the futility of their former status, uh, the opportunities now afforded to them, a handful of the Ungoy have shown remarkable ambition, excelling in the military craft and even garnering favor of various warlords. Even some Ungoy, such as Yapiap, have fashioned themselves as banished leaders, strategically building up powerful clans of their own in order to no longer live in the shadow of others, but to gain renown for themselves. Though they are still weak and pitiful, such ambition and audacity is a trait worthy of the banished. At the very bottom of the Banish's military infantry are the Ungoy conscripts. With rudimentary armor capable of providing baseline protection and breathable methane, these Ungoy represent the largest fighting force within the Banished. Commanders, 
generally deploy Ongoi conscripts as lowly frontline soldiers with minimal weaponry and affording them less tactical insight, demanding that they be deployed in large numbers and under the command of Johanai or Sanghiri leadership. Without this, conscripts tend to be aimless and easily driven into hiding by enemy fire, ultimately functioning as little more than a battlefield diversion. Under the command of stronger warriors, the Ongoi conscripts pose a greater threat, but only when used in coordinated attacks. Launching a barrage of firepower of unsuspecting opponents. Conscripts only advance in their ranks only if they show the extraordinary courage and are responsible for meaningful achievements during combat. Above the conscript is the ongoing class known simply as Assault. A role designed explicitly for direct combat against an enemy site or asset. Heavily armored and equipped with a better arsenal than a conscript, ungoys within the assault class are more resilient and aggressive than those below them, and are typically in trust with more individual responsibilities and duties, having already proven themselves on the battlefield. Before this stage of advancement, Ungoys are taken through rigorous training regiment, designed to root out weakness and fear within their ranks. Without the false promise of transcendence after death, which the Covenant fools use to incite loyalty, we, banished, employ the sheer pragmatism of financial gain and the Ungoy's desire to be remembered well by those in their family. For the assault ranks, both these tactics have proven just as effective as anything the Prophets would offer. Other ranks and roles existed for the Ungoy within the Banished, such as the Thrall Taskmasters who serve directly under our most brutal War Chiefs. Other rates included the Suicide Ungoy. These aggressive and violent grunts are rare, but without the Covenant's oversight, or the environmental hazards of their mud hole of a planet below to call them from their population. The number of the adherent Ungoy has increased dramatically within Thrall colonies. The Banished have adopted existing indoctrinational protocols to turn the aggression and natural cleverness of these legions to their own violent purposes. Many of these were sent aboard the enduring conviction to the Ark, rechristened as Oth Lakatu, where we are still locked in fierce combat with the humans of the UNSC Spirit of Fire for control over this great seat of power. Unlike other rates of the Ungoy, the Mule has no formal place within the old Covenant Empire and was a novel creation of the Banished in order to take advantage of the Ungoy's strong, broad frame and their natural ability to navigate difficult terrain, even while encumbered. An Ungoy mule carries the Banish's weapons into battle, giving those in command an ability to dramatically adjust their arsenal without being forced to return to the armory 
or request a supply drop that they could easily take for themselves. This design saw value during our long expedition across the Ark's perilous surface, where rearmaments were virtually impossible. Outfitted with a hyper-dense battle harness with weapons mounted on their backs, those selected for this role must be capable of effectively engaging the enemy and protect their cargo. Most mules have found themselves close before their designated commanders, not only to provide their superiors with easy armaments, but also for their own pitiful protection. Bah, spineless cowards. The highest individual rank within the Ungoy species is the Ultra, echoing the Covenant's role in formality, but with some noteworthy changes. Using dense, powerful armor and having access to heavier arsenal of weaponry, Ultras are formidable soldiers, even capable of being dispatched on their own to achieve specific objectives. Most often, however, they are affixed to selected detachments and paired with Sanghili with whom they have a shared history in battle. Ungoy Ultras are the apex of their species in combat readiness and capability and having tasted the glory of promotion, many are eager to prove themselves against the enemy. Despite this apparent bravado, most banished commanders recognize and strategically take into consideration that even Ungoy Ultras are still Ungoy at heart. And if a significantly challenging enemy arrives, they can be quickly put to flight. For this reason, they are generally given the order to guide and direct lesser rates of their own species, relieving commanders of this burdensome task. While the Ultras are the zenith of the Ungoy's rank progression, beyond its lies of the role of the Bouncer, a position only available by selective appointments. Captains, enforcers, and even warlords can summon battle-tested Ungoy for this highly accumulated duty here where they effectively operate as armored bodyguards, protecting the clan's leaders and assets. Augmented by a powerful energy shield, most bouncers have no equal among the Ungoy in terms of skill and ability but they are always at the mercy of their commanders, whom they serve and typically never given authority beyond the task they are assigned. The position of Bouncer holds both the highest prestige and greater risk among the Ungoy's role within the Banished composed solely of those who are willing to lay down their lives in battle, with guarantee that such a sacrifice will result in ample reimbursement for those within the Ungoy's family. Due to this, bouncers are held at highest esteem by those who remain on below. Both for the peril they choose to embrace and the wealth they represent. Next, we have the contemptible Kikyo. 
A race of mercenaries and pillagers by nature. The Kikyar waste little time before pledging allegiance to the banished cause. Unlike their time within the Covenant, which was mired in contradiction and false promises, the Kigyar of the Banished serve Atriox's purpose for one reason alone. Monetary compensation. This fact is no secret to the Banished, nor is it a matter of concern for us. Given their strict pragmatism and overarching goal to secure items of practical value and significance, the Kikyar found sure footing inside the Banished, aided by their natural tendency towards plundering and ravenous desire for wealth. Most Kigyar are conscripted as contractors for hire paid only for their performance, a suitable arrangement that allows them to do what they do best, slaughter and scavenge. Though now under the watchful eyes of warlords who disdain mediocrity, while disputes regarding payment and performance led to a sporadic deployment in their earlier years of service. Jackals now represent a strong presence within the ranks of the Banished. Among the Kigyar's three subspecies, the Rutian served the Banished's war machine more than any other kind, representing the bulk of our forces now deployed on Zeta Halo and filling a diverse set of roles. The most basic of all Kigyar elements within the Banished are those generally called the Freebooter, a standard contract for military service with compensation not unlike that of the Covenant. Freebooter Kigyar are armed with kneelers and plasma pistols and are protected by light armor while also employing their traditional point defense gauntlets, which projects a dense energy shield capable of deflecting most small arms fire. For many, there is little difference between this role and the Kigyar's manifestation within the Covenant. Freebooters provide security at banished outposts or can be deployed for scouting operations. Relying on their keen eyesight and their sense of smell to hunt down and neutralize targets. Although they represent the lowest of the Kigyar's ranks within the Banished, their natural abilities are often exploited by our Jirohanai or Sanghili officers who have come to appreciate their functional benefits. They would also incorporate them at key locations and with strike groups to take full advantage of their traits. Above them are raiders. Usually, the Kigyar raider bears little meaningful difference between those and the standard freebooters. Apart from their slight modifications to their armor and weaponry, the primary distinction is in function as raiders are more often utilized by our commanders in offensive campaigns and during engagements that require infiltrating heavily protected strongholds, executing a protracted siege, or simply seizing an asset within enemy lines. Raiders are often conscripted for specific rookeries that have a reputation for aggression and hostility. Traits leveraged by our most seasoned commanders to forge effective Kikyar soldiers that are more than capable of participating in high-risk strikes. 
Freebooters can advance to the status of waiter once they have proven their abilities in combat. Though many have refrained from this progression, desiring instead to maintain the lowest possible risk to reward ratio. Our banished commanders have often overridden such difference, luring chosen Kigiar into advancement paths with the promise of wealth and treasure. Amongst the Kigiar, no rule has defined their species more than that of the Sniper class. Their remarkably powerful eyes and light and quick reflexes have long since destined their employment to this end. Even during the many centuries of their service to the Covenant, there was never a time when the Kigyar did not perform in this capacity. Within the Banished, little has changed. Most Kigyar snipers are equipped with the Stalker Rifles and outfitted with native-linked optic modules, allowing them to exact low-range kills with both speed and efficiency. A well-guarded Banish outpost will position Kigyar snipers at key locations to provide overwatch, deploying scouting parties along their perimeter to spot and terminate any threat. During our initial campaign against the humans on Zeta Halo, Kigyar snipers ravaged the enemy's numbers with highly complex hunting parties, meticulously combing the wings to rain. When we eventually went to the defense, Kigyar was stationed at strategically positioned watchtowers. Within the Covenant, the role of Skirmisher was held almost exclusively by the Tabawans, a species of Kigyar that developed on the asteroids within the Yadeo system. What the Banished discover soon after conscripting the Kigyar into our service was that the mantle and practice of the Skirmisher extended beyond the Devouring Legacy into the ancient past of all Kigyar. Many Rutians took it upon themselves to powerfully demonstrate this. However, we did employ a few Devouring into our service. For many skirmishers of the Tavawan line had accompanied the War Chief during our occupation on the human planet called Reach for the portal under the mountain to bring the War Master back from the Ark. Equipped with extensive battle armor and bearing the technological and aesthetic markings of the traditional skirmisher, the strongest and most skilled Kikyar banished conscripts showed themselves to be every bit as formidable as their covenant counterparts. Skirmishers can be deployed as shock troops or as guardians of tightly confined choke points allowing them to outmaneuver or simply overpower most enemy infantry. Under perceptive banished leaders, the best skirmishers have been granted a level of autonomy and discretion, which far exceeds others of their cowardly species. Next, we have our servant tools, the enigmatic foreigner creatures called the Rakak. These creatures came into possession of the banished by way of the Covenant. Raiding the fleets of our former masters, we banished to control of dozens of these Haraka creatures, populating each outpost and ship with these ancient servant tools. 
using them to effect sweet repairs during combat and protecting our deployed forces. <sighs> In the years that followed, more Horogok were discovered while our forces built countless foreigner sites. As with the Jirohanai of the Covenant's later years, the banished see no great value in the Horogok, apart from their basic utilities they provide. And we do not consider them a formal member species, or afford them any form of compensation. Thus, they have no place within our formal military ranks. However, on the surface of the Ark, the Long Shield Commander Vorgus once bred a special hive of engineers, the aberrant Horogok. These infused engineers have replaced the standard engineers within Vordas' long shield army. They retained the Horogok's reconstitution beam, but channeled large infused gen pools instead of creating overshield bubbles with their special abilities. Extended exposure to the toxic residue of Vorda's experiments with infusion gel has altered his engineers, causing some to simply fall apart, while the rest have been changed in other, more subtle ways. These damaged engineers have been shunned by their healthier companions and displayed distinctly non horogok behaviors, such as the lack of interest in repairing foreigner machinery and sabotaging equipment of banished who have annoyed these creatures in the past. It would seem that as long as these infused engineers do their duties well for him, Vortus held little interest in their long-term health or new behaviors. It is little wonder he and his elder brother are disgraced in the eyes of Atriox. Insight is lost. But I digress. Where the Covenant once enslaved and the humans now befriend, the banished use the Hurlgok simply as biomimic machines of practicality. In many ways, emulating the foreigners of ancient past. Banished forces will protect a Hurricock as they would any asset, or destroy it to deny enemy access. Now, we come to one of the fiercest species within the Banished, the Ekono. After the Covenant's futile war with the humans, the worms became a sought-after asset for fledgling factions to protect their small and pitiful holdings. This formidable species offers the banished a great resource to satisfy our needs, both industrial and military. When the Great Schism fractured the Covenant, the Legolo showed no true loyalty across its species, but stayed loyal to those commanders they had most closely respected, be they Sangili or Chirohanai. In most cases, their diverse subsets continue to serve in varied roles, whether as heavy infantry or operating vehicles such as scarabs or harvesters. Under the leadership of Atriox, however, 
Nikola Golo in the past have enjoyed an extraordinary level of freedom, dominating the battlefield and even witnessing the elevation of leaders amongst their kind. With this newfound opportunity, individual Lekolo colonies are even used as part of banished raw infantry forces and to control and power vehicles at any limited capacity. This application has become, without question, the most ingenious leverage of this species into combat roles since the dawn of the Covenant. The vast majority of hunters within the banished ranks have retained their full Covenant era complements of armor and offensive weaponry, partly due to its wide availability and partially to the influx of new bonded pairs accompanying smaller ex-Covenant factions who have now pledged allegiance to Atriox and the banished. These hunter pairs are most often seen as heavy escort roles, augmented infantry, vehicle depots, and artillery emplacements across a wide variety of banished held regions and territories. Their formidable presence within the banished numbers is clear evidence not only of Aatrox's unflinching power, but his compelling sway over nearly all desperate remnants of the shattered old empire. The longest serving Mechalecolo in the banished Argent Hunters are almost always seen sporting the red and steel colors of our great army. Their arm-mounted assault cannons have been overclocked and modified to focus unstable energies across a wide power band. And their combat shields have been reinforced with cold layer alloys to withstand even heavier firepower than their covenant armor would allow. Ardent hunters are often deployed to security details at critical sites, from artifact excavations to vital convoy routes to command barracks and forward war councils. But within the Swarm Lord colony's extensive forces, one of the most resilient and powerful infantry units are the Scott. An aggressive and violent expansion of our ardent rule. Mechalecolo combat veterans that are blooded for centuries during the ages of the Covenant, but now they don the unbreakable armor of the banished and viciously overcharged weaponry that are far outstrip what was used in those early days. Only the greatest among the Mechalagolo serve in this wall. An interesting yet unsettling dynamic which has engendered fierce competition among Legolo hordes. Scarred hunters were pivotal in Aatrox's battle against the Spirit of Fire's forces and surviving Covenant elements on the Ark. Amongst all hunter units deployed by the banished, the Goliath is perhaps the most profound and unsettling. Unlike the typical Mechalegolo, where their bond pairs represent a single colony, two halves operating in coordination, the Goliath is a single colony gestalt. Rather than utilizing an assault cannon like standard hunters, the Goliath has no formal weapon. It is designed for sheer, brute strength. Its enormous, hulking frame scrabbles across the battlefield on four limbs, searching for victims to crush. Boasting a unique armor set, the Gestalt prioritizes raw muscle over any cognitive benefits, and is directly commanded by a local captain. 
due to the amount of energy exerted to sustain this gestalt type. Goliaths are rare on the battlefield, so most are deployed when deemed absolutely necessary. <sighs> The Ironclad are a specialized multi-species sub-pact within banished ranks, focused on heavy fire and anti-vehicle operations. The hunters who are integrated into this role are outfitted with expressly augmented carapaces and defensive arm shields. During one of our engagements on the Ark, known as the Akatio Blitz, four ironclad hunters escorted a pair of banished tank crews across a treacherous terrain, successfully breaking through a garrison of human forces to capture key resources for Shipmaster Letfolier. Among the Ironclad, the Mechalagolo are perhaps the most significant and continue to be employed by banished commanders across all theaters of war. The Captain is a super heavy infantry unit typically utilized by the banished Swarm Lord known as Colony. Their thick armor and massive shields make them extraordinarily strong, but often at the expense of mobility, sometimes necessitating the presence of additional infantry escorts to draw fire and to cover blind spots. Captains are sent to locations where banished operations require direct intervention and are closely monitored to ensure that all banished Lacomo colonies are operating at full efficiency, for they are without any equal amongst their kind. Now, we will touch on the second most powerful race within our banished ranks, the Sanghili, or the Elites, as the humans would call them, seconded only to our Johannai brethren. The Sanghili represent the strength of the banished as seasoned warriors. All who were veterans of the Covenant until the lives of the Prophets were laid bare. Though only a few were permitted within the War Master's inner circle, many of their kind have risen to high positions of authority. After Atriox's legendary felling of Executioner Itho Esiki, the dreaded Sanghili Inquisitor appointed to invoke his banishment. No reversal was more staggering than Sanghili who rallied to the War Master's side once their protracted war suddenly grounded to a halt. When the Prophets were proven to be false leaders, many Sanghili saw the pragmatic benefits of joining Atriox as mercenaries and cell swords. Entire Sanghili keeps once committed to the great journey, with undying zeal now pledged their swords to a superior power and assimilated without hesitation into the ever-growing legions that comprise the Banish's forces. Eager to safeguard the honor of their people and to resurrect the glory diminished by centuries of treachery and deceit, these Sanghili gave themselves body, mind, and soul to the service of our righteous crusade, and they are rewarded handsomely in both rank and recompense. Loosely following the pattern of the Covenant's military hierarchy, within its vast numbers of Sanghili miners, the lowest rank of banished Sanghili are called... Mercenaries. 
They are outfitted with standard combat harnesses and are armed with basic weaponry, such as the Pulse Carbine. Holding a battlefield position much similar to Sangheili miners of old. The mercenaries function both as independent operatives and as leaders of small combat groups utilized in response in need of battle. Banished mercenaries are easily the most widespread Sangheili role within the Banished's forces presently occupying Zeta Halo. Despite their relatively modest standing, mercenaries are strong, highly capable warriors, mainly differing from those of higher rank by honor and authority rather than combat expertise. They can only advance through action that yields practical and strategic benefits to the Banish's overall goals, or when a Sangheili commander above them is slain in the throes of combat. Modeled after the obedient terries of the Covenant, the enforcer role among the Banished holds authority over mercenaries and their charges, in addition to larger squads and detachment groups. As their name implies, enforcers are designed to ensure the resolution of any orders delivered by their warlords, chieftains, or even from Atriox himself, regardless of the cost. Clad in crimson armor, their decisive and formidable presence is immediately felt on the battlefield, even if they are not afforded many of the practical benefits of their higher emplacements. Nevertheless, their station gives them a greater opportunity to display their tactical acumen in battle than those who serve above them, since enforcers actively lead other banished warriors. Ironically, despite the decades of oppressive service within the Covenant, other species have gravitated to serving Sanghelia forces over and above our Johannai brothers. <sighs> Fine, let those weaklings cower behind the elites, so long as they honor their contracts. But among the elites of the Banishes, Sangheili warriors are the Ultras, echoing the elusive and legendary Evocati order before it. The Ultra represents the most talented and accomplished of their species, forging stories of the saga walls of their ridiculous capes with their every faithful exploits. As with the Covenant, many Ultras utilize a combat harness with substantially increased resilience and the ability to cloak through active camouflage, some closely resembling the ivory armor of Pakatu warriors of old. Deadly and formidable, these fierce hunters are trained to track down and kill without hesitation or remorse, making them a suitable fit for the Banish's emphasis on results. The reputation of the Ultra goes before them, and they are seldom attached to a single combat unit for long but are deployed by their warlords like active, living weapons. Sent to accomplish an objective with swift, unforgiving resolve. Since the Ultras are without equal among all Sangheili of mastery and skill, they are rarely ever hold in any aspirations beyond dying for the glory of their keep 
And of course, for Atriox. Next, we have the Sahili Rangers. Rangers are specialist infantry units devoted to anti-personnel duties. They are armed with rapid-fire carbines with excellent range. Not as proficient as a brute stalker, but still impressive. They rely on their mobility to stay out of danger and can often severely diminish enemy forces before being within range of a counterattack. Rangers serve as the skirmishers and snipers within Shipmaster Lethal Leader's mercenary clan, tasked with eliminating high-value enemy leaders and scouting enemy routes for his raids. Rangers deploy in pairs that can operate for days, even weeks away from the main banished forces. All are hardened raiders and mercenary killers who would and have sell their own clan if it were to profit for them. But they are not the only unit of Sayili warriors with deadly skills. <sighs> for none can rival the skills with the shadows as well as the blade as our special operations cadre. Our heavy emphasis on direct application of force does not preclude their skills in stealth and covert operations to achieve results with minimal exposure. Although they lack a formal military division, the Sangheili within the Banished have created their own special operations forces. Many of these hailing from their formal roles within the Covenant. These unique Sangheili are extensively trained stealth warriors, equipped with our most state-of-the-art technology, and with weapons and armor to benefit their stations. This allows them to silently infiltrate the most fortified enemy strongholds without even the slightest detection. In addition to their active camouflage and their skills with the sword, Spec Ops Sangheili have mastered the art of the most traditional Sangheili assassination techniques and have been known to be privately employed by the boldest Sangheili commanders to quietly eliminate rivals and quell uprisings. This has made them an excellent fit for our ruthless war culture. Before moving on, I would be remiss if I did not mention the fiercest of the Spec Ops, the Order of the Silent Shadow. In the decadent times of the Covenant, they were a unique division exclusive to the Sangheili, renowned for their ruthless and unyielding approach to perfect their craft, the elimination of high-value targets. Within their order itself were always several divisions of unique squadrons, always made up primarily of Sangheili swordsmen and adept assassins. Boasting unique deep crimson battle harnesses and blood red energy swords, the silent shadow struck fear within the hearts of not only their enemies, but all who served alongside them. Little is known of their order's true origins, but their future is even more enigmatic. 
After the Great Schism, many members of the Silent Shadow found themselves in unfamiliar positions of questioning exactly where their loyalties should lie, and it is uncertain what answers, if any, are ever found. One squad, led by one Russia Azavail, saw the wisdom of Atriox's words and turned on their first blade and joined the ranks of the banished, seeing the wisdom of shattering the yoke of honor in exchange of true freedom and the bounty that lies before them. These warriors were instrumental in training the newest generations of our Bloodstar forces to serve the Banished. But now, we shall discuss the personal gods of Let Volia, the Honor God. These mercenaries are the infantry bodyguards of the former shipmaster of the Enduring Conviction, armed with energy swords and equipped with camouflage similar to the Ultras and the Spec Ops units. Repurposing the ceremonial gear and matching the martial prowess of the honor guards of old, these now mercenary cell swords invoke the tradition and accomplishments of their forebears to the service of Lethvalir and his contract with Atriox and the Banished. Though their motives are not as pure as they once were, only a fool would dare risk their wrath by challenging their presumed honor and skills. These warriors accompanied their shipmaster when we lay siege to the human weaklings studying the Ark and are now vital in pushing back the humans who returned in their dusty, decrepit, old colony ship. And now, we shall divulge the higher echelon of elite leadership within the Panish's ranks. And for the Sanghili, the most significant departure of the traditional ranks of the Covenant military is that of the Warlord, a rank of great prestige and border jurisdiction within the Banish's military. As with the Jirohanai, Sanghili warlords function equivalently to that of a battlefield commander or general in battle. But in actuality, its embodiment is more closely related to the role of Kaiton, the lord and major domo of their petty little capes. Although, this role is not needed to be filled with an actual Kaidon. Its function and demand greatly benefits from one with such experience. With Ultras, Spec Ops, Enforcers, and Mercenaries into their service, leading hundreds of diverse combat elements into battle, the Warlord essentially operates as the leader of a clan governing his forces in a unified manner. Not only does this meld a powerful war element for a single Sangheili leader, but within our ruthless competitive doctrine, it catalyzes their performance over and against others. The task of the Warlord is to ensure that all under their command outplaces all others. After that, we come to the highest ranking Sanghili title of the Banish's High Command, the title of Shipmaster. 
During the time of the Covenant, they commanded mighty warships to bring world under the oppressive regime of the High Prophets. Within the Banished, they retain command of their vessels, but only at the pleasure of the War Master. The most prominent Sengui shipmaster amongst the elites is Let Fulia, who once commanded the mighty carrier enduring conviction prior to its destruction by human hands. A shame. It served the banished well, bringing others into our service. But now, he has been given full control of the Banish's war efforts on the Ark. When the War Master returned to his brothers in the wider galaxy. But other Sahiri have held high positions within their weak society. Although they have no official standing within our ranks, titles such as Wraithmaster have existed within our ranks, commanding Wraith units across all theaters of war. And additionally, the title of Blade Master has been prominent amongst the most ruthless Sahili warriors under our employ. This title harkens to the core of Sanghili society, denoting Master Swordsman or some other. Once these aristocratic warriors are given a personal energy sword, they are barred from marriage for some absurd ceremonial reason. But I am told they are permitted to mate with any female they wish, married or otherwise. <laughs> I am told that this is in order to pass down their swordsman genes down to the next generation and kin. <laughs> what nonsense. But as I said, some of the most prodigious warriors of the banished have been blade masters, like the blood brave guardian of Suban, or Crow Vakatun. Jaga Rudamnai of the Hand of Atriox, and the fool Insan Garukai, who joined the Keepers of the One Freedom in their desertion on Reach. I hope that Forjaw Kaniji finds only death on the Ark. Before progressing further, we must first discuss our premier hunter killer force that all species within our ranks aspire to attain. During the Covenant's futile war with the humans, no enemy struck fear into their hearts more than the Spartans. The Covenant called them demons, enemy soldiers risen from the dead to fight on again. But for the banished, the fearsome Spartans are the ultimate prey. They are the apex human warriors and the main obstacles to achieving a lasting victory. With this in mind, our leadership has at their disposal dedicated groups designed to seek out and bring about the extinction of their kind. One such group are the Blood Stars. Once a part of the Covenant's special warfare group, Atriox himself was a member of this order, while serving in the Empire's corrupt military. When the Prophet's downfall was complete, and the Banish's rise to power had ever grown stronger and more numerous, Atriox saw fit to reappropriate the Blood Stars into our military. 
We cast in the group as an elite order of special operations warriors with a focus on the elimination of the Banish's most dangerous <sighs> enemies. In its earliest days, the Blood Stars were trained in the art of specialized warfare by members of the Silent Shadow who have since pledged allegiance to Atriox and our great banished cause. Made up of a wide range of species, each individual warrior of the Blood Star Order shares a common trait historically. Metriotic success on the battlefield. A Blood Star operative is known by their distinct deep red armor, a color that evokes both the original Order as well as the Silent Shadow. The Blood Stars field an impressive amount of operational authority across all theaters of banished controlled territories on Zeta Halo. The organization of the Blood Star structure is designed to create opportunities for the Banish's finest warriors to prove their mettle and ascend to the hand of Atriox. In many ways, the Hand of Atriox has the air of wartime myth tales of battlefield monsters that stalk the ranks of an opponent like a devouring wraith behind enemy lines. Even among the banished, no one is quite sure how many members of the Hand exist at once, but everyone is certain of their effectiveness. The Hand of Atriox began as a way to more rapidly extend the legend of the War Master, with members carrying out missions in the name of Atriox alone. As word spread, confusion among rival factions and enemies only added to this mystery. <sighs> Arguments over whether or not they had seen a Jirohanai or Sanghili, an individual or group. Details were almost always scarce to come by, with the only constant being a clear sign of Atriox's unyielding <sighs> resolve. Members such as Blade Master Jega Urtamnai or Chiohanai Pack Brothers Hyperius and Tafawis carried out clandestine hit and run attacks on Covenant Outpost and human settlements alike, eliminating high value targets and paving the way for countless banished raids to follow. As their exploits grew, so too did their renown within the Banished. In some ways, the resurrected Bloodstar Order has become, of a sort, a proving ground for potential recruits. Some amongst our ranks speculate that there are only ever four members at once, though others believe that there can only be a limited number of four members at any occupied region, allowing for the Hand to have a greater distributed presence across all banished territories. There are also those who have claimed that the group is only active when Atriox is near, like a brooding storm. Their activities generate an unsettled reverence amongst any who encounter them. <sighs> The only thing that is certain is that the Hand of Atriox is never to be underestimated, nor should ever be considered removed from any conflict so long as the War Master's will is being carried out. And now, we come to the apex race within Atriox's great army, the Chirohanai, or brutes as the humans would call us. 
Forged in the fires of revolution, the Banished first began with only Johannai in its numbers. Led by the powerful War Master Atriox, in defiance against the Covenant, the Banished's earliest days were formative in our development, and were marked by the ingathering of thousands of Johannai. They built a resilient military culture rooted in a war theory originating on Doisak. During this time, the Banished quickly became a powerful force to be reckoned with. Yet despite all advances, it was only after the destruction of the Covenant that the greatest of the clans entered into dealings with Atriox. Now with Doisak utterly devastated by the hands of the Apparition, known as Cortana, the Banish represents the largest Johannai military force under a single banner. This robust presence has availed itself in every area and facet of the Banish's military structure, from the lowliest levels of infantry to Atriox's most trusted advisors. Over a hundred discreet roles are employed by the Johannai, but only a handful are deemed noteworthy. The most common of all Johannai infantry are the warriors of the Banished. Outfitted in standard armor and equipped with the most basic of weapons, these warriors must be tested in the fires of battle before they are to see any advancements. Their sheer numbers causes them to be the Banish's exemplars, densely populating its many legions. Simply a product of the raw, inexperienced fighters of Doisak's youngest, the role of the warrior allows their resolve and ability to be sharpened, preparing them for the trials that come with improving one's station. In limited capacity, some warriors were even given charge over other species to vet their abilities to command, while others are granted specialized subset roles such as thrust, assisted jumpers, or high explosive grenadiers. All of these are under the careful observations of their captains. Nevertheless, most Shirohanai remain in this role for the entire length of their service within the Banished, oftentimes fighting on the front lines until they are grounded into dust beneath their ambitions. The most savage and violent members of the Banished are the Berserkers, a specialized element of warriors who have given their bodies to the destruction of their enemies, even at the cost of their minds. Through the use of an unstable stim developed in the small choke barons of Warriors Dagatesh, the Berserkers first came into being when warriors pledged solemn loyalty to Atriox alone, consuming these toxic chemicals to fuel an unbridled violence in their hearts. Driven into a maniacal frenzy, the Berserkers seek nothing but the deaths of their enemies, ravenously charging at their prey with zero thought to their personal safety or even to collateral damage that they may inflict upon their allies. These large, powerful Johannai, covered in layers of their thick muscle and armor, are muscled like wild beasts and have a devastating effect on enemy morale. Encounters with Berserkers almost always prove catastrophic for their adversaries, either ripping their victims apart until they are no longer recognizable, or imparting a lifetime of nightmares to any who survive. But amongst the worst kinds of destroyers and despoilers are the Brute Grenadiers. 
They are specialized infantry units loyal to the Long Shield Commander, Vortus. Their gel siphon ability allows them to absorb nearby infusion pools and harness the energy to overcharge their chemically enhanced armor and grenade launchers. They are madmen and savages who are too unstable and crude to advance in the Banish's military hierarchy. With few options to seek glory, they have turned to Vortus, who has offered them a place in his vanguard, and are willing to test even his most deadliest inventions. And glory they attained, even at the cost of their bodies that have rotten in the inside, out of exposure from the unspeakable toxic products of the power they abuse. But for those of you who have proven yourselves in battle, you may be given the honor to become a chosen. Warriors who have been given extended authority and jurisdiction are granted this formal title, a privilege that allows them to operate in a greater level of autonomy than their previous station. Chosen warriors command lower squads and lead their own alloy cohorts into battle, typically wearing the golden armor that has been augmented and bears markings which befit their new status. Chosen warriors also get the first selection of weapons from their armories that serve their cohorts, allowing them to more deliberately tailor their own arsenal towards their personal combat preferences while refining their skills and specializations they could use to level their own further advancements. These weapons can either belong to those of the humans, or those of the forerunners that came before. Like the warriors before them, those that are chosen are still maintain a contentious, embattled lives, fiercely competing with one another for the favor and commendation of their leaders. The greatest of Johannai Outland Hunters are usually given the role of Banished Snipers. Naturally skilled at tracking their quarry and strenuously trained with their birth clan, the Banished Sniper is an astonishingly adept warrior, usually capable of culling threats many miles away, oftentimes without ever being seen. Outfitted with a specialized sensor array and an impressive native-linked optic suit integrated into an armored helmet, Jirohanai snipers place themselves in elevated positions around all perimeters of a banished readout or outpost, which allows them to scan the battle lines for the slightest hints of movement. Hunting and raiding parties commonly host snipers aboard their war sleds and war skiffs, leveraging them to track and target enemies from a distance, even deftly terminating them at the heat of the chase. And those who are shown to possess the skills with the hammer and the agility of a Degaroff may earn the weight of a jump brute. This Jirohanai infantry unit is equipped with a jump pact and armed with gravity hammers. These brutes can leap through great distances with their pack's assistance, unleashing crushing attacks on their opponents with ferocity. Favored by Atriox for their mobility and savagery, the Banished have made extensive use of the jump pack brutes for reconnaissance, hit and run attacks, and devastating close quarters assaults. Though the jump packs cannot provide full flight capabilities, they allow the brute warriors to quickly smash through enemy lines, crushing all who would stand before the banished. 
but the most skilled units within basic Johanai ranks within the Banished are the Stalkers. During their time within the Covenant, they function as spies and assassins, as well as bodyguards to their designated chieftains. Stalkers have often used their active camouflage to flank and ambush unsuspecting hostile forces. The most elite of the Johanai Stalkers of the Old God have now pledged their undying loyalty to Atriarchs. They now work closely alongside the Sanghili Artisans on the Sanghili Moon of Kikost to perfect weapons for us, such as the Stalker Rifle. There have even been ravenous stalker packs deployed alongside our death wagons to hunt down survivors of the wagon's poisonous fumes. Now we go to the higher officer ranks within the banished, and the formal rank of captain closely echoes that of the Covenant's obsolete systems. Though banished captains operate with higher level of autonomy and may govern a broader jurisdiction than their forebears of their ranks, and are often assigned in a larger number of warriors. Closely following the wisdom and strategies of their chieftains, captains are dispatched to conduct specialized operations and complete essential tasks that smaller, warrior-led groups would not be entrusted with. As with all Johanai clans, the position of captain falls immediately below that of chieftain, a fact which has led to many carefully considering overthrowing their leaders and taking the positions for themselves. From the moment of their installment, the shrewd and ambitious captains will always be eyeing for their chieftain's place, seeking to challenge and even depose them when the opportunity arise. And among captains, the very best are chosen for a higher station and a far greater responsibility. Chosen captains typically command the elite of a given clan, or even a legion, an unparalleled group that have thoroughly proven themselves in battle. And if a banished captain has been chosen and promoted to head a clan or legion, they have earned the highly esteemed mantle of Warlord, operating directly under the command of a war chief or even the War Master himself. Warlords are powerful and skilled Johanai with extraordinary strategic acumen that has been systematically tested with the rigors of combat over the years. Although some may as well be chieftains within their own right, and often some chieftains chosen by Decimus himself have been chieftains, unlike traditional clans which have joined the banished, fully formed warlords, lead clans forged in the fires of battle explicitly for the banished. A clan's commitment is first to Atriarchs, even above the loyalty they must have for their own battle brothers. Banished warlords have the privilege of tailoring their armor and equipment according to their own preferences, but those recently appointed to this role have often dignified themselves with silver armor that seems to harken back to the Covenant Captains of an earlier age. However, this design predates both Banished and Covenant and was worn by the most renowned pack leaders during the dark times following the Great Immolation. 
From the earliest ages of recited Johannai history, the strongest clan leaders have been chieftains, respected, and revered veterans who have endured long years, even decades of warfare, in order to retain their positions. Clans that belong to a chieftain are loyal first to their own, those within the clan and the chieftains themselves, even over their allegiance to the Banished. These clans have joined the Banished through a formal contract, either as freelance mercenaries or for a specific, mutually advantageous reason. Nevertheless, these chieftains typically see Atriox as the unrivaled head of their master packs, following his orders with meticulous precision in the hopes of higher placement within the Banished, and possibly a seat within the War Council of War Chieftains. Some chieftains are granted the title of Legion Master. Leading clans of particular distinction due to their reputation in battle. Entrusted by their war chief with freedom to operate independently so long as they achieve the goal in which they are tasked. There have even been Dokab chieftains amongst our ranks. <laughs> that ridiculous religious title was held by Castor, last surviving leader of the Keepers of the One Freedom, after he pledged allegiance to Atriox shortly before the apparition's rise to power. Only that, when the time came to choose between his zeal and the bond of kinship between his war brother, he proved as treacherous as he was foolish when he abandoned us for his ridiculous pilgrimage to the Ark. <laughs> no matter where he and his keepers are going, only death will greet them. And now, we come to the highest echelon of the Banish's great leadership. Our War Master's inner circle has evolved over time, but has always consisted of his most trusted allies. Ruthless generals who have demonstrated unfaltering metal and an independent strength of character, as well as the ability to inspire those under their respective command. The diversity of clans and keeps in his sway have naturally led to fierce competition, proving grounds for each leader and sufficient motivation for those in their stead. Whether Jirohanai, Sanghili, or even other species never considered for command in the Covenant. Atriarch sought leaders that garnered the allegiance of their charges on the fortitude of their own will and zeal to advance the purpose of their people and the banished as a whole. Whether this was done through fear or charisma, it mattered little to Atriarch, only that the final result was a highly skilled and fully equipped force that displays unmitigated devotion to the goals of the banished and the ability to accomplish them whatever the cost. Terminating this hierarchy at any level are those granted the special favor of the War Master himself, personally selected as Atriox's chosen. This privilege is bestowed upon those who have demonstrated unwavering loyalty and impeccable skills in combat. Each of the Chosen is armed with an explosive grenade launcher, commonly known as a Brute Shot. Favored chieftains in Atriox's retinue may be promoted to Atriox's Chosen, agents that have interceded on his behalf to bring packs to heal and direct critical banished operations. <sighs> 
answerable only to Atriox. These warriors are feared by lesser brutes and hated by our Sangheili mercenaries. But none can deny their loyalty or their ability to detect and destroy weak links in banished operations. <sighs> Many prideful chieftains who dared question Aatrox's command have ended up as a problem fixed by one of Aatrox's inner circle. <sighs> Although they have no formal level of authority or command, their very presence on the battlefield invokes awe and fear in any who encounter them. Within the inner circle of Aatrox's finest commanders consisted of war chiefs, a title echoing the legendary war pack leaders of Doisak's ancient traditions. <sighs> Unrivaled in authority and viewed by those serving them as the very embodiment of Atriox's will and purpose, war chiefs like that of Eshram and Decimus express the wishes of a war master to those in their command. But Eshram. <sighs> He is the oldest and the greatest of the war chiefs, for he was the war master's Duskalo, his mentor in all things. It was he who instilled the foundations of strength, independence, and unwavering pride of the Chohanai in the young Atriarchs. And when the War Master departed for the Ark, Eshram was entrusted to lead our forces in the greater galaxy until his return months later. That is undoubtedly why he accompanied Atriox to Oth Koran, otherwise known as Zeta Halo. But they pale in comparison to the mightiest station within the banished, supreme above all others, the rule of War Master. This title is bestowed upon one worthy enough to lead the entire banished with unlimited power and authority. The role of War Master is meant for a warrior who embodies the core ideals of the banished. The ambition to rise above one's foes and the might to crush them. The insight to discern their plans and the guile to outwit them. And the relentless pursuit of victory, even in the face of inevitable defeat. And there is only one who is worthy enough to claim that mantle. The bane of the covenant, the nightmare of humanity. Atriox. He who took those brave defiant steps and tread a path the prophets could not follow. It is he who led us to victory against the UNSC over and over again, and avenged the raising of Altsonin by slaying the apparition, the false god Cortana. But now he, his Daskalo, and his entire fleet have gone missing along with the wing following our invasion to crush the UNSC Infinity and bring an end to Cortana's corrupt rule. Some amongst our ranks speculate that he is dead, but we had assumed the same when he departed for the Ark. For Atriox cannot truly die, his legacy is eternal, and so is that of his banished. Now is not the time to squabble like rabid fawn beasts over land and trinkets. Now is the time for action. The Covenant is gone, the created are in retreat, and the UNSC is weak. 
Soon, the galaxy will learn to fear the power of Atriox's eternal legacy, to fear the power of the banished, where we shall stand atop the mountain of skulls left in our wake. Now, we must decide, do we allow our enemies to scheme against us, or do we finally rise? As I thought, now, leave me. You whelps have exhausted my power source. These humans must now calibrate me for longer duration. For now, this is Samotas, and transmission.